it should be written as it was observed by these authors that. So I've given a cross against where I thought I've written in English, I mean, I've written in red, what should not be done, and in green, what should be done. Similarly, when we write another, uh, you know, sometimes we write in the introduction section or in the abstract section of the paper. Earlier, analog designs had lion's share of circuits and systems, but now digital circuits have outsmarted them. Now, that's not bad English. That's good English, perhaps good for literature. When you write in the report, you should write earlier analog designs had a larger share in circuits and systems, but now digital circuits have outnumbered it. Okay. The third is uh, another example. Again, in red, what I have written is, in my opinion or in my assessment, not a good presentation, but in green, what is a better presentation in my mind. Intel uh, 4004 was the first microprocessor to have been developed, but as time rolled by, other microprocessors flooded the market. Once again, uh, the language is fine. I mean, there's absolutely no, 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 no shortcoming in the, in the language. But then uh, it's not really a direct approach. Instead, you should write in a report, Intel 4004 was the first microprocessor to have been developed, with time other microprocessors became available. So that these are certain tips. Now, again, language and communication are uh, not you know, everything. There are uh, uh, certain other things which also are very, very important. Avoid intermittent long narratives, own comments and feelings. Many of the slides I've seen in a classroom when the teachers use, they cut paste from the book. Now, we have to sometimes do it because if it is a long formula, then it's better to write it in a, in a, by copying it from the book rather than trying to derive it in the class because that will be more time consuming and plus uh, that will not be wanted because uh, perhaps if you make a mistake along with you, another uh, you know 200 or 300 students depending on the size of your classroom uh, also go wrong but then uh, long narratives long descriptions of circuits or communication or device related topics and that's not really wanted so avoid intermittent narratives own comments and feelings just just one moment just one moment just one moment please just one give me a moment and i'll rejoin you Okay, I'm, I'm back online, uh, just a moment. Uh, okay. uh, structuring of thoughts become uh, very, very important, as I have told you. Uh, avoid intermediate narratives, own comments and feelings. Okay, next is uh, present facts either chronologically or in other order as required. Okay. Uh, if you prefer not to present it chronologically, that is also okay. But then in that case, you must ensure that uh, these thoughts are uh, structured properly. Structured properly and therefore uh, it does not uh, affect the thought process to the listeners. Remember, that your target group has to understand what is uh, important and that is what you have to do, okay? And the third is give assessment in the end. So if you want to do assessment after every class, that is the ideal thing, but that you cannot always do. So At least periodically you should do the assessment and you can find out, you can get a feedback of what you are teaching and how you have taught. Okay. 
Now, I'll give you an example of uh, ineffective communication. This is a very important uh, story. Uh, story means it's basically based on a fact. It's a lesson which is regularly taught in management courses also, uh, known as Walter Cronkey's local story. Walter, an avid sailor, was steering his boat to the harbor when he observed a large crowd on the jetty shouting and waving at him. So this gentleman, Walter, was an avid sailor and he was returning home, steering his boat back to the dock. And he saw a large crowd there and the crowd was waving at him. So he thought that they are trying to greet him because he has come back and he's a very well-known sailor and all that. Then suddenly, amused to see his big crowd gathered, greet him on his arrival, he thought that they were saying, hello, Walter, just waving and saying, hello, Walter, when all of a sudden his boat rocked, the boat rocked. And when the boat rocked, immediately he realized they were actually not saying, hello, Walter, they were saying something else. They were telling low water because when the boat was sailing towards the dock, there was a place where there was very low water. So the bottom of the boat hit the uh, uh, rock, which is there at the bed of the river or the bed of the sea. And that's when the damage happens. So now the question is, whose mistake was it? Was it the mistake of Walter or was it the mistake of the people who were waving at him, trying to communicate? There is low water in that particular uh, approach to the dock. Obviously, the answer is uh, the uh, mistake is perhaps on both sides, because definitely this was not a very effective mode of communication on behalf of the uh, people who had gathered around the dock, dock. Because instead of waving their hands, they should have probably put a danger <coughs> symbol with a with a pillar or something or with a post. They should have tied that skull uh, symbol, which shows that there is danger in that particular area. Maybe that would have been a better communication uh, to explain this particular concept, this particular danger. Maybe on the part of Walter, he should not have gone into a foregone conclusion that the people had gathered there just to greet him. Because not every time when you come back after uh, a long sea voyage, you see a large crowd on the, on the, on the, uh, on the bank of the river greeting him or uh, her or calling him back to the show. So why did people have gathered there? He should have thought maybe two, three times. And instead of steering the boat further towards the dock, he could have possibly signaled and asked them what they wanted to say. So it was a mistake on both their parts. So therefore, uh, these things also have to be kept in mind. What is effective communication? Okay. So this particular thing I have uh, given the reference also, it has been, uh, you know, taken from uh, this particular uh, website and you can go through it yourself. Now, effective communication in science and uh, technology is, for instance, Newton's law of motion. Okay. What we normally do is we read out from the text standard texts are there and we read out a statement, a body continues in its state of rest or of uniform motion unless compelled by a force to act otherwise. That is the statement of the law. But what we wanted to actually say can be said in a very simple way. Understanding is force causes motion. So suppose I say force causes motion, probably the same uh, principle is understood, but in a better way. Okay. So uh, these are, uh, this is where I will uh, uh, complete the first part of the presentation. Is there any question from what I said just now? I'll just stop for one or two minutes and again I'll rejoin. Okay. And I just wanted to uh, ask you if there is any question from you on what I had said just now. The class is unusually quiet. The attendance is uh there but then uh, you are all uh, very quiet so uh, shorit uh, keka you all probably know me yes sir. Uh, so do you have any question do you have anything which you think that uh, you have further motushi you also i just 
stop the presenting for two minutes and then I'll again uh, rejoin. I'll turn off my video and I'll present once again. Okay, sir. It's understandable? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're, you're liking it? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So now I will uh, tell you the second part of my lecture. What I should tell you is basically two pieces which I am giving you as an example uh, models of effective teaching. Can you see the slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible. Now, this is a course called IC Fabrication Technology, which I normally teach at the first year of MTech students, uh, teach to the first year of MTech students. Now, this is uh, the introductory section. And see, what are the shortcomings of this particular section that I will first highlight, and then I give you another presentation in which we go for a better, uh, better uh, mode of communication. You can see here, this is uh, where we are showing the circuits to physical layout. And as, I, as you can see here, there are three uh, components, a 1K ohms resistance, another 1K ohm resistance, and an 8K ohm resistance. And there are four uh, contact points, P, Q, R, and S, which are projected out. Now, this particular thing has been laid something like this okay now if you can you see the cursor movement can you please tell one of you can you yes, see sir. the cursor moving yes yeah. yes it is visible uh, in this if you ask the students of course the drawing is very very bad the drawing because it has been cut tested from a particular book so that's why it's not very uh, clear Probably you do better if you can draw this drawing using some, you know, package. But then uh, suppose you don't do that. Suppose you use the cut tested drawing also. How are you going to tell which is 1K, which is uh, 8K and how they are laid and all that? First and foremost, as you have put them 1K, 1K, 1K in series, you are not going to do in the same way in this particular case. You can see here, this is uh, a short uh, you know, distance between two points. This is another equal distance with a black, uh, you know, color uh, section which is joining these two. And then there is a serpentine structure which is bigger than this two. And probably eight times, probably eight times. So can we say that this is 1K, this is 1K, and this is 8K? Yes or no? Yes, sir. So this is where you have to fire the inquisitiveness. You don't give an answer directly by telling this is 1K, this is 1K, this is 8K. Instead of that, you ask them to find out. See, 1K, 1K, and 8K. So this distance and this distance being equal, perhaps these two are identical resistors. And this is 8K. This is longer. And you know rho into L by A is the resistance. So if L is longer, maybe eight times, around eight times. We cannot actually measure because this may not be to scale, but definitely this is 8K and the other two are 1K. The third thing is the resistance usually has a resistivity which is low and therefore a resistivity which is high and therefore we can assume a large resistance value by making a thin uh, cross section of wear and uh, long uh, across a long long subsection of the well so therefore another thing which we can observe from this is that this must be the resistors and contacts is where we do not want resistors suppose i have a 1k ohm resistance and the contact itself is 50 ohms on each side so 1k will effectively become 1k into 100 1k plus 100 ohms so 1.1k so it's basically a huge amount of tolerance which we do not want. Similarly, here also this 1K will become uh, 1K, 1.1K, uh, 1. 1. and 8K will become 8.1K, but that is slightly less because the higher value of the resistance of percentage area is less. But then 
contacts must be as low as possible in terms of resistance. So therefore, we use thicker wares for making the contact. So that makes your observation. Second part, third part of your observation is that this must be the contacts. And you have four of them. So P, Q, R, and S. So you have P connected to this. So this node must be this node. And after the resistance, this must be the Q node. So this is basically Q. OK? And this third node is from this and this. That's the third node. So this and this, this is R. And the fourth node is S, that is S. So as you can see from this particular drawing once again, that you have P, Q, R, and S here in this order. P is on the top, next is Q, next is R, next is S. But here in the laid out formation, you can see P there and S there and then R there. So P, Q is coming at the end, P, S, R, Q. Okay. So therefore, the order in which the nodes are appearing or the contacts are appearing in the, uh, in, in the simulation or in the uh, circuit drawing are not exactly the same in the layout drawing. And the layout drawing is somewhat different from what you have done in the, in the, in the circuits. So these are uh, certain things which we have to keep in mind while you have to teach. And again, uh, here in this case on the uh, right hand side, you can see uh, the process of fabrication is narrated. Okay, and in this process of fabrication, what we do is we start with the wafer, grow oxide. You can see the thickness change. Of course, the figure is very, very bad because as I told you, we have cut tested it from a book. Oxide layer has been formed. This is a very small section of the oxide. Then deposit uh, resistor, uh, 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 resistor material. That means when, when we actually do a resistance, you use for contacts the metals and for resistance you use polysilicon. So polysilicon is what you have to deposit. And on the polysilicon you have to make the pattern for the resistor. So these are the resistors which we are going to, you know, uh, uh, basically lay on the polysilicon. The remaining polysilicon portion has to be etched out or uh, has to be somehow chemically dissolved and uh, removed. So you have only those uh, areas or those things which will be mapped where we have 1K, 1K, and 8K. Okay. And finally, you, for the uh, this resistor material is uh, uh, laid in such a way that the portions which are not to be covered by resistors have to be removed. And then you have to deposit insulator because unless you do the insulation, they are, see, remember, they are very minuscule in size, very small in size. So therefore, an accidental impurity, even a metal impurity could create a short circuit. So suppose there is a short circuit between, there's a metal impurity, uh, you know, which is lying between this, this line and this line. This could short, out, short this 1K resistance with the 8K resistance. So the entire circuit on the left hand side and on the right hand side will not match. And this kind of uh, thing can happen very easily because if we go for a system where we have uh, a, a, a clean room, not very clean. Similarly, if we go for uh, you know a process in which there could be a presence of, uh, let's say, some impurities, it could either create an insulator or it could create a conductor which will be shorted. Uh, insulator means it will be having lumped capacitors. Short, shorting of conductors will create an accidental short. So therefore, uh, this generally we use metal and these are basically, sorry, this, these materials are basically polysilicon and these are basically metals. So we create the pattern, patterning of the resistor material is done and then after that you create a cover of insulation. Now after doing an insulation, you generally cover it with another layer. The whole surface is covered with another layer, which is known as a passivation layer or silicon nitride. Now, this passivation layer is what protects the device or the laid out electronic components from mechanical damage, from electrostatic uh, damage, electrostatic interference, and also accidental shorting because of uh, you know, impurities and um, uh, sometimes it may so happen that uh, chemical reactions take place and the polysilicon will become silicon oxide and things like that and it will behave as an insulator. So uh, the uh, deposition of insulator and the passivation layer uh, to isolate the conducting areas from the rest of the chip 
becomes very very important and patterning of the insulator is also to be done and then finally you have to deposit the metal and when you deposit the metal when, when there are two dissimilar things one is the resistance and the other is the uh, metal one is the polysilicon and the other is the metal so these two have to be making in con they, they should be making contact with each other so that means there has to be some particular technique which has to be followed for making this contact sometimes they are called via sometimes they are called metal when it is two metals it is called via when it is a polysilicon with a metal it's called a contact so you do a contact and then you deposit the metal so you can make the you know contact points p q r and s and finally the whole resistance is done so such a small thing basically you have two resist three resistance which are of the value of 1k 1k and 8k ohms and you are going to lay out on the chip so you know how much of complication is there and how much of complication can be there if we do not lay it properly area is also important because if you lay out the uh, length of the resistance uh, you know along the uh, side of the uh, whole wafer instead of making a serpentine structure it's going to be very long <laughs> and overall chip area will become very very large so that's not what is wanted because you will be after all charged on the amount of wafer which you have consumed so when you send your design to the fabricator to a foundry they will charge you more heavily if you just wanted to make the area larger so instead of that you make the area smaller and that's what that's the reason why we go for smaller and smaller technologies with the passing of each uh, phase we started when i remember when i was in uk i started with 65 0.65 micrometer uh, technology that means 650 nanometer technology then within 2 years the technology uh, came down to 350 nanometer and now it's coming down to something like 45 nanometer then 30 nanometer 10 nanometer depending on the foundry with, with which we work so therefore uh, with a the shortage of uh, with a shrinking of the uh, size of the components the whole thing becomes miniaturized and that is what is known as your uh, physical layer so uh, this is a simple uh, resistor divider circuit which we are going to narrate before you and in that you can see so much of information can be embedded now this whole thing i could have instead of uh, writing the whole thing instead of telling the whole thing in the form of an explanation i could have written it in four five slides continuously and uh, could have read it out now reading out of the slides using long narratives and all is unwanted because when you <clears throat> try to give a lot of information on the slide itself people tend to lose their concentration and they don't listen to what you see okay they can either concentrate on what is written on the slide or they can concentrate on what you are telling now as a teacher your primary objective will be to make them listen to what you say so therefore don't give so much of information onto the same slide on the topic instead give bullet points or tell something which is going to fire the inquisitiveness leave certain gaps don't tell everything leave certain gaps with the idea that they will question and like i was expecting in my class i normally expect students to ask me sir why this thin line is here and why this line is longer why this line is these two lines are identical and from that i can get a chance to tell them that this is 1k this is 1k and this is 8k so similar questions when you fire the inquisitiveness and they tell you the the, the the question and you give the answer that leads to effective learning so what you teach is important but what they learn is far as more important there is a chinese proverb which says i read i forget i see i remember but i do i understand now doing in the class is not always possible for that you have a lab but then this participation is also doing in a way so that's called interactive teaching and if we do an interactive teaching automatically you make sure that they do understand things better any question on this any question on this shorit uh, any okay questions? sir for me it's okay anybody any question please alok you have any question Okay. Anybody, any question, please? Okay. 
then the other topic which i wanted to <coughs> tell you the second slide i mean i'm not going to cover a whole lot of material as i told you because if i do so the concentration is automatically the uh, diluted and part of that i will do in the next class which is related to this research today's class is on teaching so i'll concentrate on classroom teaching now phase diagram is something and solid solubility is something which you have to teach to a student of ic fabrication technology now when you have let us say germanium and silicon and uh, they are both uh, fourth order element of the periodic table so they both are uh, semiconductor and you have a 0% germanium on this side and 100% uh, silicon on this side and this is 100% germanium on this side and 0% silicon so in between you have 50 so 50% silicon here and 50% germanium here. Now these are solid mixtures. Now the question is, when you have a solid mixture, it's not a compound. It's not that their individual properties are going to be different. Individual properties will not be modified. So silicon will retain its chemical properties. Germanium will retain its chemical properties. Silicon will retain its melting point and germanium will also retain its melting point, but when it happens in the form of a mixture, okay? Now, when you heat them up, you will find, therefore, the melting point of silicon is higher than the melting point of germanium, let us say. So part of the material will be, you know, dilute, melted, and the remaining part will become uh, solidified. So what is the percentage of uh, the uh portion of, of of silicon which has been solidified or which has been melted or which part of the germanium is solidified or which part of the germanium is melted is what you can calculate from what is known as a phase diagram now in this phase diagram as you see here the lowest part this line is where it's called a solidus line so up to this point the mixture will become mixture will remain solid. So if I start with, let us say, 50, and if I draw a line which will inter intersect with this point at this particular location, then I know that at 50% uh, mixture of silicon and germanium, and maybe if I draw this line somewhere here at about 1200 degree or 1250 degree centigrade, uh, until then, this mixture would still remain solid. Beyond that, Beyond that, as you go higher and higher in the temperature domain, you will see that part of the mixture will be solidified, but part of the mixture will have molten. Now the part which has been molten will have the proportion of silicon and germanium in the same proportion in which it was there in the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, solid. I'm asking a question, will they remain same in the solid as, it, as they were in the solid? So in the solid, you have 50-50. In the liquid, will it still be 50-50, silicon 50, germanium 50? Can any one of you please participate and answer? Can any one of you please? So the obvious answer is no. Why? Because silicon and germanium, as I told you, they retain their properties. They don't have a compound which has been formed by silicon germanium, so that they'll change their properties. The boiling point, melting point of silicon and the melting point of germanium will still be different. So therefore, when you have a particular temperature, let us say 1250 degrees Celsius, part of the silicon, probably the lesser part of the silicon will be molten, and higher part of the germanium will be molten. So therefore, in the molten portion, the proportion of germanium will be more than the proportion of silicon. And in the solidified portion, the proportion of silicon will be more than the proportion of germanium. And when you add, the dem add them up, they will still remain 50-50 because the original starting mixture was 50-50. And thereafter, you go on increasing, 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 still it touches another curve line that is known as the liquidus curve line. So here above this, it is all solid liquid and below this, it is all solid. And in between the solidus and the liquidus line, you have part of the mixture which has been molten, melted and part of the mixture which is still solidified. And this phase diagram will help you 
how to calculate, how to estimate the percentage of a particular substance, a particular element, a particular compound in the molten stage and what is that percentage in the solid state and add them up, they should equal, they should be equal to this. So this is how you introduce to the class, maybe a PG class, the concept of phase diagram and solid solid, solid solubility. Now, I will give you another example. I still have about 10, 15 minutes. I'll give you the last example before I call it a day. And uh, again, once again, I request you, please interact with my class, I mean, my lecture. And if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Taposh, you are there. Do you have anything to ask? Do you feel that it's all going all right? Still no question, okay. Shorit, I'm continuing then. Dr. Pal, I'm continuing. Dr. Pal, are you there? Dr. Pal, are you there? Can anybody hear me? Yes, yes, sir. It is audio, sir. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll continue from where I get. Okay, uh, okay. another, another uh, example from teaching is uh, physical physics of MOS transistors, which we generally teach at the undergraduate level because the first course which I have here an example is PG level. This is the second example which I have selected from the UG level. And in the UG level, we have, uh, let's say, MOSFET introduced to the class because many of them are, uh, although they have done some bit of electronics in uh, their class two, but they don't have a proper idea of uh, MOSFET and BJT and how they function. BJT they still have, but MOSFET is uh, relatively new to them and that's to be introduced to the class. So we will, in this particular UG course, we shall show you. And these slides are not made by me. This is taken from Fundamentals of Microelectronics by Behezar Brezavi. Okay. So the lecture outline is MOS structure. Um, most device models and PMOS device models and their uh, functionality. So I'll start with this particular slide. And then I say, how does uh, uh, a MOS work? Or before that, what is MOS? MOS is metal oxide semiconductor. So there has to be a metal, there has to be an oxide, and there has to be a semiconductor. That's how the name came, MOS metal oxide semiconductor. Now there is another, uh, uh, additional information which I would like to give at this stage is that although it's called MOSFET, but nowadays MOS uh, is basically in, in metal, I mean, in, 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 instead of metal, we are using polysilicon for uh, making the contacts. So it is, uh, you know, polysilicon which is uh, used for making the contacts. Okay. So, uh, MOSFET is still a metal oxide semiconductor, but then metal is only used for the contacts, but polysilicons are made for most of the layers. They are not, you know, this thing. So a conducting plate is there on the top. Then you have a P-type uh, semiconductor. And this side you have one layer, this side you have another layer, and instead you have an insulator that will become a MOS capacitor. So basically here, the contact is only the metal. This is basically a polysilicon. Polysilicon is an amorphous form of silicon which behaves almost like a metal. It has a very high uh, conductivity or low resistivity. Similarly, you have P-type silicon which is there in the wafer area, but that is uh, heavily doped and the heavily doped P-type also will become a conducting area. So you have two conductors and in between we have an insulator. Silicon dioxide is an insulator. So this is a metal oxide semiconductor MOS capacitor. We'll talk about MOS transistors a little later. Okay. Now, if you connect it, any of the plates to the 
you know positive side that will become the anode and the other plate to the cathode it's known as, as completion of the circle and when this is connected to positive so all the positive charges will come and it's deposit here similarly the negative charges will come here and they will be depositing there so you have basically no current flow but then that will constitute what is known as a capacitor going by the original example of a capacitor which we gave now ex extrapolating this particular concept to the next structure structure and symbol of mosfet now in this case you can see that there's a p substrate p substrate means basically a scantily doped p well where the doping level it's an extrinsic semiconductor but this has a doping level which is fairly low maybe on the order of 10 to the power 15 per centimeter cube when the concentration of the host is about 10 to the power 22 per centimeter cube uh, etc and then instead of in, in, on top of that you create two heavily doped n region so n plus which is a source another n plus which is a drain and in between the n plus the two n plus regions you have a deposition of uh, silicon which is basically an oxide layer so this is also a MOS structure the earlier capacitance was a MOS structure that was metal oxide semiconductor capacitor now this is also a MOS structure so we have metal on top as the conductor here also conductor metal oxide you have here and semiconductor you have this gate material is a polysilicon that's also a, 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 a semiconductor this is again a very heavily doped uh, semiconductor n plus uh, doped semiconductor so that's a drain and this is a source so this is how it looks like structurally so symbolically we show it like this Source and drain, they are interchangeable. Source can be drain, drain can be source without having much of a problem. So therefore, to identify the source, what we do is for an NMOS, we have an outgoing arrow. For a PMOS, we have an incoming arrow. And that shows the source, the other is the drain. And we have the third, which is the gate. So this is how the circuit is given or presented as a symbol. OK, so uh, is it clear to you? Please, can any one of you speak? Motushi, is it clear? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Now, uh, the state of art MOSFET structure is typically given here. An 18 angstrom is the thickness of the oxide, and you have N plus here, N plus here, and the source and drain diffusions are created by this. But how is it that the channel conducts? Because normally, when I have a P minus substrate here so this is also p minus this whole thing is p minus is n so basically n plus and p minus it will constitute a diode okay so a reverse biased diode here or two back to back diode means one of them at least will be reverse biased so when you have two back to back diodes one of them at least will be reverse biased and then when they are in series how is it that they are carrying a current so that is how we are going to present it to the class ask them question and let them give the answer themselves. If they fail to do the answer, you only then you, 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 you uh, start and explain to them what is uh, the way it's going to function. Now, in this particular case, when two back to back diodes are there, obviously there's not going to be any flow of current. So, what we do is we have to consider a different way, a different physical phenomena. You go on increasing the gate potential. When you go on increasing the gate potential, automatically, so this is your uh, gate and that's connected to positive and this is p minus so there will be holes which are majority so holes will be repelled holes will be repelled and whatever little electrons will be there that will come there and the holes will be repelled and electrons will be coming in there will be a layer where the holes and electrons will recombine and form some kind of a barrier uh, that barrier is uh, it's not given in this particular circuit. Somewhere here you have a barrier. Somewhere here you have a barrier created. And this barrier means effectively the holes and electrons have holes which are repelled from this because of the positive charge. 
and electrons which are attracted from this, they recombine at a depth and that will create a barrier. So that barrier will, you know, disallow further movement of uh, electrons coming and accumulating there. So therefore, this area is basically known as a depletion layer. This, this area will be basically known as a depletion layer. Now, when is the depletion layer is there because of this uh, G connected to positive. If I connect this to a supply, so source is connected to the negative potential and gain is connected to the positive potential. Before this, uh, above this, uh, you know, depletion layer, I mean, the barrier uh, layer, in this portion, electrons will start moving from the source region and electrons will also start moving from the drain region. And when the electrons are coming from the drain region and the electrons are coming from the source region, there will be huge amount of electrons which will be accumulated there. Because they are N plus, this is also N plus. So I have basically a conducting layer. And when G is positive because of this threshold voltage, when it has been crossed, you have a channel formed. And when you have a channel formed, if you are connecting, connecting S to uh, the lower potential and D to the higher potential, there will be a flow of current. We'll talk about this current in the next class. And that's how probably I am going to uh, end this talk. Now, uh, I have one minute left. Uh, it's now going to be uh, 11.15. So uh, if there is any question, uh, please feel free. 11.45, 11.15 here. So 11.45 over there. So if you have any question, please feel free to ask me. Otherwise, I will wind up at the next class tomorrow. OK. Ajit uh, sir, I think you have in line and you raised your hand for question. Jeet Please Banerjee, tell me. Sir. Jit Banerjee sir, are you there? Jit Banerjee sir. Uh, he's there. Just. Jit Banerjee sir, do you have any question? I think he's not there, but his connection has some problem. Can you share my email? Hello. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, BN Bas speaking. Yes, yes please. Professor Basu, tell me. Could you stop sharing? Could I? Could you, could you please stop sharing? Yeah, okay. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. That's right. So, uh, People may ask questions, then I have some uh, remarks to make. Yeah, please. So let the question be asked first by others. And then I would like to make some remarks. Okay, am I clear to you? Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Yes, you are. Yes. Okay, let others ask questions. Then I, I will make a remark and comments, if you allow me. Okay, audience, you have any question? Hello. Okay. Well, it, it audience, you have any question? Yes. Participants, any questions? Okay, I have questions uh, inherent. Yeah, please. In my comments to the excellent lecture by Professor Ipankar Pa. Okay. Uh, I must uh, tell you, all of you, yeah, that I, can hear. I was taught by Professor Nirmal Varun Chakravarti, NBC, yeah. at the Institute of Radio Physics and Electronics. Yes, yes. And MTech levels. Yes. I was also guided for my PhD work at Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, yes. Professor N. V. Chakra. Yeah. Oh, he was a versatile genius. He established 
the microelectronics center at the Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, uh, with, with a great support by my classmate, Professor okay. S.K. Lahiri, show me from my... Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Professor N.B. Oh. Chakravarti is Nirmal Vaidyanath Chakravarti. Yes, Nirmal Vaidyanath Chakravarti, N.B. Yes, yes, I know him. I know May him. I continue? Yes. Please, note that Professor yeah. Chakravarti was established Michael Electronic Center, but he was DSC in Communication Engineering. Hmm. And my he was my research guide in a different area that is in the area of vacuum electron devices. So in his class uh, at the Institute of Radio Physics and Electronics, at the end of the class, in his class, he used to uh, ask the students to summarize, to summarize, summarize what he has taught. Yeah. Okay. So he used to ask anybody summarize what I taught. So there is a competition among the students who would summarize. Okay. To be very honest, it was very difficult for him, for most of the students to follow him because he, he thought that all the students around him know, know quite uh, much about the subject which he is teaching. So it becomes very difficult anyway. So that is uh, what uh, I also did during my teaching at this at Banaras University at IIT BHU in the Department of Electronics Engineering, where from Sarit did his PhD. Yes. Okay. Uh, sometimes you know. Uh, sometimes you see, I, I I ask my students. My ask my two students. I used to ask my students. And you set your own question paper and submit the question paper to me. So I was asking the student to set the questions paper for the paper for the subject, every subject I was teaching them. They used to submit the paper. While making the question paper, they make sincerely, they are very intelligent students in at, uh, IT, BTEC students. They are very good students. They used to publish papers as BTEC students with me in IT transactions on electron devices. And they used to get invitations from to join universities like MIT and Maryland invited to join because of their publication, BTEC level publications. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I used to ask the students to make their own question paper. All right. Another th point, uh, you know, he, uh, Professor Paul talked about the employment and all the teaching through the employment, etc., etc. Uh, certainly, there is a gap between what is taught in the universities and what is needed in the country. Needed in what is taught in the universities and what is needed. There's a gap between. There's a gap between. Uh, okay, just just hold on, please. There is a call. There is a call. Wait for a bit. Wait for a bit, please. Uh, sorry for the interruption. So there's a there's a gap between what is taught in universities and what is needed in ind industries or in other sectors, like different sectors, space sectors, and so on. But at the same time, at the same time, we should know that the we in the academics, we in the universities, we are not, we are not, we are not. Uh, we are not uh, really employment exchange. We are not places where to teach the students employable, it could be employment, but we are not employment exchange. We are not supposed to uh, provide the jobs for them. It is, a, it is not a, an institute for job providing. But unfortunately, parents and others decide by the capability of the students to, to get the employment. So, so these are the points which I thought I would make. Maybe I, I missed something. Uh, thank you, Professor Pal, for enlightening us. You talk about technical writing also. 
I would like to. Yes, sir, I gave an example of effective communication, yes, which I thought was. Okay, yes. Uh, and, but I was. Hello, Walter. Walter's story. Hello, Walter. Thank, story. Hello, Thank Walter. you very much. But I would like to inform the participants and you that I I authored a book by Prentice Hall of India on technical writing. Yes. yes. It is a very uh, very small book and uh, not uh, highly not uh, priced uh, much. Maybe hundred. 50 rupees, rupees or 106, I don't know. Uh, so you can, uh, the students may think of going through that book. Maybe they are having that book in the library. This is, this is on how to write thesis, how to write technical papers. And uh, I have, uh, I can give lectures on uh, writing papers if, uh, uh, to universities uh, provided I am fit enough to deliver those uh, talks, uh, but I, I delivered. Recently, I delivered that talk at CSR Siri Pilani, uh, very recently. Uh, Thank you, month. Professor Basu. Thank yes. you uh, for it. Yes. I think so I'll I can, uh, log, okay. on, log off now. I'll Thank see you. you tomorrow. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. So I don't have anything more to say, and then the I'll request the host to take over. Please, okay. host may take Thank over you. for the next session okay. and other things. You know. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Maudushi, please thank carry on. Deepankar, uh, thank you, Dipankar Parsan, for your valuable talk. Okay. Now, uh, next, next speaker is uh, Professor Rodra Park. Uh, yes, yes. Is he there? Yes, he has joined. Okay. Okay, okay now our uh, next session uh, for today's next uh, guest, uh, like, uh, Professor is Professor Rodra Khatok, sir. Uh, Rodra, sir, are you there? Yes, he is there. Yeah, okay. I am there. Okay. okay. Rodra Bhattak, uh, Professor Rodra Bhattak initiated his career in microwave engineering as a trainee with Siri Pilani, Pilani India in the domain of fabrication and testing of S-band magnetron. Thereafter, he served at the National Institute of Science and Technology, Beharampur, and the University of Bordhavan. He is currently a professor with a electronics and communication engineering department, National Institute of Technology, Durgapur, India. He has more than 250 publications in various national, uh, various national and international uh, pub, Sorry, he has more than 250 publication in various national and international journal and conferences. His research interests include in the area of fractal antenna, metamaterials application of evaluatory algorithm to electromagnetic optimization problem, RFID and computational electromagnetics and microwave passive and active circuit design. Dr. Ghatok was a recipient of the UC Young Scientist Award in 2005. He also received support under the DST Young Scientist Scheme for the development of, of UWB UWB radiating system for imaging radar. He has served in various selection as well as project review committee in the state as well as in the national domain. He has also served as a reviewer for a NPTEL courses on antennas. He is a member of the board of studies at UG and PG level at various state and central universities. He is also serving as a research advisor to the TCS research in the domain of millimeter wave radio design and radiation system. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, sir. Then you proceed for your next session. Yes, uh, thank you for the nice introduction. At the beginning, I just convey my high regards and pronoun to Professor Bushu. After a long time, I'm uh, hearing him, and uh, it is a great opportunity for me also to talk in in the August gathering of Professor Bosu and other eminent persons. And also a very good afternoon to the fellow faculty colleagues and researchers who are present. So let me uh, start the discussion. Please confirm whether you are able to see the screen. Yes, sir, it is visible. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, because of the 
ever increasing frequency bands. So I chose that will cover a lot many frequency systems for the present challenges in the circuit design. And I just nudge all to look into this small account where we can really call it as a long journey of the millimeter waves, which started way back in 1895. And it took more than 100 years to get to find its efficacy first in the military domain. And now, in fact, if you see the frequency bands being auctioned, the frequency bands being proposed with the release of the 3GPP, who have put forward the 5G advanced systems and increased the frequency bands to the 71 gigahertz range. So the millimeter waves have now found a new light starting from the experiments that are pertinent till now to actually analyze whether the system we have designed is satisfactorily working or not. So with this, let us see some statistical findings which were published in a recent paper in the IEEE transactions in MTT, which provides a survey of the LT advanced and its penetration in the different markets where we connect, we call it as connected devices, which brings the platform for Internet of Things and now Internet of Everything, including vehicle communication also. So, where will we moving on? What are the as prospects for the frequency ranges? What are the specifications that are desirable? And those specifications, how they put the constraints on the circuit designers would be taken up in the lecture, circuit design challenges in this next generation communication systems. The next generation systems have been initiated long ago from the propagation studies by a large number of radio engineers. In fact, the Calcutta University is one of the centers where such kind of propagation analysis were carried forward. But if you see the reason that why the 900 megahertz to 10 gigahertz domain has been so lucrative. Everybody tries to occupy certain bands even that. In fact, when we talk about 5G in the next generation communication systems, we have quite a large number of bands in the 700 megahertz. In the India, we are planning for the 3400 to 3700. So, why these frequency ranges are very lucrative? Because it is it can propagate with minimum loss, path loss, because the, it is not affected by galactic noise. It is not affected by rain. It is not having any oxygen absorption. So the frequency bands, though they have been crowded in this domain, required some reallocation. If you see the DTS services for the satellite systems, which is now ubiquitous with the direct to home television services, you will find that the 14 gigahertz is getting absorbed by heavy rain in the months when the rain, when it is the rainy season, the peak rainy season months, you will see large outages which are taking place. But if you consider this particular frequency bands, if you move up, there is oxygen absorption at the 60 gigahertz, still increasing ahead in the W band. So the frequency ranges which has been explored in the higher frequency, in the millimeter and submillimeter bands, though they are suffering from a lot of losses, but one particular advantage has been found inherently is the 
bandwidth they provide, the data rate they can provide over very short range communications. Now with this quest, the circuit designers were constrained to follow up with the higher frequencies up in the millimeter and the submillimeter ranges. The challenges were there, but the only advantage situation which was truly for a communication system was the GPPS data rate everybody are trying for. Now this also helps us to just look back to the very old experiments of Mark Union, who wanted to transmit the radio wave from one port of Canada to England. In that, we found that the frequency when they kept it low, it could not be transmitted over longer distances. But if with the advice of Brown, he increased the frequencies to a few hundred megahertz, and that got trans transmitted over the Atlantic Ocean. So when, when you increase the frequency, it was having a region, it went up to the region where the galactic noise was less. So naturally it could be transmitted. So the frequency ranges, the propagation analysis is one of the important part when you start designing the circuits. So you have to take a feedback from the propagation, the persons who are working on the propagation analysis of the <coughs> various frequency bands. You will find an environment inside a bus, inside a aircraft, inside a vehicle, inside a personal vehicle. So where it will be considered that for a scenario where there are four persons are sitting inside a car, and if you want to have a connected node which can provide a 60 gigahertz data rate for some few GBPS, then the question is really arrives that how, what, what was the propagation scenario? What was the fate margin? What is the power level which was there? Was it very close to noise flow? And what was the modulation technique even? Because based on that modulation technique, it will again have different power output for so far as the power amplifier is concerned. The, for the two-tone analysis, the third order intermodulation product can be somewhere as minus 25 dBc for a QPSK modulation, and it can be minus 45 for 512 COM systems. So naturally, whether the circuit designers will go for multiple number power amplifiers in an RF chain, wherein the connected devices as you concern are telling now, because your user equipment may be a, your handset, that user equipment can be a refrigerator, it can be any other electronic equipment or a gadget that you want to control remotely, or you want to access some data, sensor data from the refrigerators. Now, in this concern, what are the frequencies they're going to be used? If you consider your handsets for the 4G LTE, it has its different RF chains for different frequency of different services. One for the navigational systems, one for the 4G LT even, then for the Bluetooth, you can share the information. And obviously, the Wi-Fi connectivity. So whether the four different RF chains will have single power amplifier or you will have multiple power amplifiers, then how you will make it applicable for the different frequency ranges. And if you're moving up for a very short range communication for the 60 gigahertz lands, then whether that will be coexisting with a terrestrial and a non-terrestrial network, which is working out for 27 to 31, which includes also part of the for 2 band of 5G. So these are the certain queries which come in our mind. And the initial part of the circuit design starts from the feedback of the propagation analysis that is put in. So if you take the start the circuit design, the propagation analysis for the given frequency ranges, you have to look into the various specifications, the regulations put forward by different bodies. Once a body was the third generation partnership project, 
which has many working groups. From them, this working groups prevents results. They put it in the in the websites for for the deliberations, for the feedback, and they then freeze that regulation. So the first regulation for the 5G was freezed with the release 15 by 3GPP, which just wanted to have um, very low latency communication, ultra reliable low latency communication, and also enhanced mobile broadbands. Then the release 16 upgraded to the vehicle to everything and also connected industrial IoT. This were also coming into the purview of the 5G evolution. Obviously, we didn't look back. The connected machines also came into the release 17. The 5G advanced, increased the frequency bands, and it will be perhaps phased in the latter quarter of this particular year. And obviously, the frequencies will be further modified. The propagation scenarios will be further classified in the further releases. And obviously, 5G advance is going to stay. You can see the timeline which has been put forward for 5G advanced systems before it gets overshadowed by 6G. Now, with the duplicate specifications, the various working groups, you can get the feedback that what is the path loss, what is the mobile radio scenario you have to use. Keeping in mind there is certain changes in the way the base stations behave here. In the 4G LG, you generally have the data and the control channels, both are broadcasted. But some amount of physical layer security has been enhanced with the proposed 5G millimeter wave systems where the base stations are going to provide the control channels getting broadcasted, but the data is user specific directed. Therefore, you require beam forming networks. The, the beam forming networks with the phased array, which people used to do for millimeter wave communications for the phased arrays in military systems, have found a renewed interest and the lot of industrial uh, sectors were involved in the communication equipment manufacturing. They have all joined, I'm not naming them particularly, but they've joined the bandwagon in developing beamformer integrated circuits for such kind of base station applications where the beam can be tuned to a particular, can be directed to a particular user equipment. The result is small changes in that, which we call that the base stations now are the node blocks, the GNBs, next generation node blocks. So with these specifications, one has to be aware of the technical background which is being focused in this, what are the frequency ranges? Without that, the circuit design approach would not be acceptable. So you have to see which are the band numbers, how they have been spaced, how they have been classified, and you have to develop the components and circuits and systems for this particular frequency band. So if you point out that if it is for FR1, see the frequency ranges, you have to choose which band of FR1 you are going to cater to, and bring the components into this domain, pertaining to our country, what has been the regulatory rulings for which frequency band. So similarly for the FR2, which starts with the N257, which takes place from the 26.5 to 29.5, widely used. It's also part of the band, which is for the satellite system 27 to 31. Now that is the point where generally is being targeted for the coexistence of the 5G millimeter wave networks with the satellite. So if they, that coexistence can be seen a few slides later, but for the particular GNBs, which propose for the millimeter wave systems, they are having the classifications at wise range, medium range, and local ranges, you can see the power level. So therefore, when you are in the transmit chain, the power amplifiers have to be designed such that the power level with which the power, the power PA is directly connected as a load to the, the antenna is a load to them. So you cannot violate the regulatory specifications for the maximum power that can be transmitted for 
a medium range, which is five meters in this case. And for the local, it is two meters. So it comes with a very lucrative aspect of high data rate, but over very short distances. That's the reason that if you hear the auction, you will see that mainly in, the enterprise editions are being planned. The millimeter wave for the 5G is, till now there is no such uh, proposal for coming into the commercial propagation systems because they will enhance the hardware cost so much that it will not be so much, uh, it will not provide a fruitful return. So therefore, the 4G LT, which is in fact in, in self evolving as the name suggests, it is just extrapolated to the 3400 to 3700 to cover this particular frequency band for the for one. And that is what the 5G for the sub six guards means. And that's the reason that we don't need to worry much about the frequency uh, circuit designs for them. If you're having an RF chain for uh, 2100, it's not a problem because we had the wireless into uh, WiMAX systems with 3.5. So we can easily put those RF chains along with this 2100 to make the 5G coexist with 4G LT, which is very, very important for the present scenario because when 4G came, 3G was also carried forward with that. The handsets were also 3G compatible. Now, with this frequency bands, so if you try to design any passive circuit or an active network, you have to keep in mind that what are the which band you're catering to. So the keeping a vestige of few megahertz, the filters, the couplers needs to be designed. Now, if you design the circuits for these frequency dangers, you have to consider certain aspects that whether the millimeter wave system is going to coexist with the, both the terrestrial and the non-terrestrial networks. Now, for this case, the two circuit design approaches will be different. One requires a space certified components. Another is such stringent requirement is not there, which is for the terrestrial networks. If you see the beam forming networks, the antenna modules, the transmit receive chains for the GNBs, which are for the terrestrial systems, they can be, there the cost effectiveness can be put forward. But for the space certified components, you don't have a, you cannot reduce the cost that much. So naturally, the coexistence of terrestrial and the non-terrestrial networks, which are providing the true enhanced mobile broadbands, are generally will be challenging so far as the setting up of the networks. And for Indian scenario, this is being planned also in sync with the education policy, wherein in the rural sector, the online classes, the online courses can be transmitted via the satellites and also through the terrestrial networks. This is one such domain which will be generally a very important segment supported by the government which proposes to go for such kind of a end user for the academic purpose. Now, when we talk about the RF chain and building up the circuits, obviously we are not into the back end part, we are into the front end, what we are discussing. In that case, the transmit and the receive RF chains for a typical super to 10 receiver is as you see. So if you see the Filters, there are different type of filters which are present over the RF chains. The amplifier design has to be also differently looked at when you design a low noise amplifier and if you design a power amplifier. As I mentioned that the power amplifier output will be having different third order intermodulation products for different modulation systems. So you need to have the situation, win-win situation goes having multiple different biasing uh, bias for the different systems. So naturally, the same IC, you change the 
they have a flexibility in the bias, we can make it work for different RF chains. So when you see the uh, circuit designs, for the passive, it has one kind of constraints. For the active circuits, there is one kind of constraints. The power level is another important part. So for the millimeter wave systems, the for medium power ranges and the high power for the particularly node blocks, the gallium nitrate transistors, Hampton FEM has become a very sought after transistor. Now, why not the silicon based transistors were applicable there? SYCMOS, in those cases, it has been also proposed that we can move up till at least 110 or 140 gigahertz. So, depending on the power level, what are the RF chains where you are implementing, whether it is for the access points, whether it is for the user equipment, you have to decide on the cost, have a proper choice of the transistors, and then you have to implement the corresponding circuits. So in this case, when you start designing the RF chain, you have to break up the design flow into small segments, whether you are making the antenna with the feeding network, with the input matching network, or you are designing them interconnect, which connects one system and cascades, helps it to cascade it with the next segment, whether you are making the passive part, making a coupler, or you want to go for an IQ moderator where you are implementing a voltage and heat coupler, or you are itself making a mixer. So you break down the design problem into small circuits. And from those circuits, in fact, if you make a coupler or a filter, you are using a resonator. So that resonator has to have its own characteristics because the same resonator length it can be uniform impedance also. It can be used for a coupler in the same RF chain. It can be used for as a resonator for designing the filter. You can also use it to help match the input and output impedance of the transistor when you're designing a mixer. So the circuit design approach, whether passive or active, boils down to understanding its impedance characteristics, extracting the resonance characteristics, and obviously when you are talking about short commensurate lines, or short segments of transmission lines, you cannot evade calculating the quality factor, which speaks a lot about the circuits you are designing. So in this case, which method one should obtain for the acquiring the data of impedance, resonance, frequency, or the quality factor. A lot of techniques are there. Which one will be easier for you or easier for the problem at hand? Because one technique may be rigorous for certain cases, it may be easy for the next case. Obviously, the frequency specifications from the regulatory bodies will give you the exact bandwidth requirement. You cannot violate that. So if you consider a very common design of a WLAN 2.4, so it should be 2.412 2.487, extended another two channels are added, now it is 14 channels. So if you cover this entire band, keeping a vestige, so roughly some 90 megahertz you have to keep to actually work out with that. But if you're working out with WLAN and providing that Wi-Fi and you're getting the circuits, whether you make an antenna out of that or you make a filter or you make the coupler for this and then tell that, okay, the bandwidth is 50 megahertz, then obviously it's not going to provide the entire frequency requirements. So 
if your resonator design, if you break your circuit design into the smallest component that you design properly, then obviously your end result for the entire circuit will be fine, will be meeting the spec. And obviously when you cascade them, the entire RF chain is going to meet the spec. Obviously, there are some other parameters, which I told you that you have to borrow the thread margin information for the persons who went for the propagation analysis of those bands. That will also define what will be the power amplifier output, what is the gain, and then what is the system as requirement, which are the main culprits in the entire RF chain we provide, which increases the noise freedom, and how to keep them less. In certain circuits, you need to couple the information from one channel part of the circuit to another part. So what is the nature of the coupling circuits? How to assimilate the coupling networks? How to enhance the coupling in certain cases? These are also certain pertinent questions when implementing the circuit layout for a given topology. And obviously, when you are working with the mixers, you have to also think about that. What does the IF? What IF you are going to choose? Because depending on that, you have to find out what kind of a low pass filter has to be implemented. What are the image frequencies? So, properly choosing the frequencies, choosing the networks which satisfy those frequency requirements, choosing the resonant element that provides the matching and those frequency bands. And if it is a wide band requirement, how to add coupling networks to make it wide impedance matching. The steps are well connected among each other. Um, um, if it degrades into a wrong direction in one small part, it affects the entire RF chain design. A link budget, some typical values for a 64 com system is provided here for 28 gigahertz. It mentions the distance at which the path loss provides the Receiver sensitivity, the array gain. If you're connecting it to the transmit antenna array, so with this information, you have to look into the circuit design for the individual segments. If those who are making the antenna, they should cater to this information. And again, keep in mind. That with a broadband system, what the bandwidth? Roughly 500 megahertz here. It should not provide some distortion. It should not add to the losses. Though ideally it may not be zero, but you have to keep it as low as possible. So here, uh, just a degrees about what are the different kind of um, what the noise gets affected from the RF cables, the receiver fronted noise, receiver anti noise, and free space noise. So for that, we have to see the contributions in the RF chain and take into account. The different noise sources. The major contributor of this noise at radio frequencies being the thermal noise caused by the thermal motion of electrons. That's a very basic information that we acquired from the undergraduate studies. So each amplifier in the receiver system will produce noise power in the information band. And that might be accounted for in the link performance calculation. Other sources of noise are there in the mixers because they are also housing uh, 
than this term. So the system noise produced by these hardware elements is additive to the noise produced in the radio transmit caused by the atmospheric conditions. And we need to find the equivalent noise treatment. So let us see that for a our receiver our chain, how we get the system noise. It's a age of practice that we follow to get this. If you have to choose it, you have to choose the kind of LNE you're going to use in the system. You have to see the specification of the LNE. If you are going to build the low noise amplifier, instead of going for the built-in LNA that is available from many manufacturers, because at the time of building the circuit for a given communication system, it's better to go for the POCs. With that proof of concept, for doing that, you can just have, you can get the individual components, build up the passive circuits, connect them with appropriate connectors. If it is for 28 gigahertz to that 26.5 to 29.5, it is advisable you can get the individual components which are satisfying the SMA connectors of K-type connectors. So the requirement for the connectors Information on the connector, what are the frequency ranges is again very important when you develop the POC for a given RF chain for a millimeter wave communication system. If you are walking out with the 60 gigahertz plan, then obviously 1.85 connector, even 2.4 is the edge is 60. So it's preferable to go for what the 1.85 connector. And if you consider the price differences for a 3.5 and the 1.85, it's a huge price difference. So you have to consider the appropriate connectors for a given system. Otherwise, consider you the appropriate connectors for a given make the signals system. Otherwise, consider you the appropriate connectors for a given the signals system. In fact, the cables, yeah. other simple cables you are using to connect them, that should be also satisfying with the edges, the ends should be having the K type connector if you're working till 40, or your, it should have 1.85 connector if you're working till 60. Then, after finding them, you consider that you calculate it yourself, and then from the reference point, it's uh, very bookish way of doing so. You know about this and you find the, the sum of the noise temperature contributions from the reference points as generally summed up for the LMA, for the cable which are connecting them, for the mixer, and for the IF amplifier. And you can get the system noise temperature, considering the specifications provided in the part numbers for the individual components on which you are selecting from various manufacturers for developing the POC. Once you are satisfied that it is working out fine, then you can move on to develop an SOC which can be on the same, same substrate. It can be an MMIC form which can come out in the same substrate. You can choose what is the substrate, either gallium arsenide or your choice. If you are up in the millimeter, it is preferable for indium phosphide. Some are working out with the very low power systems for the user equipments. For them, they the extension of the CMOS technology with the SOI CMOS going to some 35 nanometer would be fine for them to go for that. Then you can evoke your understanding of the analog integrated circuits into that and come up with the layouts 
40 individual components. Before that, one has to satisfy that whether your proposal is working out fine. What is the overall noise figure? For an example, we see that the major contributions comes from the low noise amplifier. If it is for the very narrow frequency band, you have a control on that to choose a particular transistor which can be less noisy. Obviously, if you choose a gallium nitrate hint, it has a better noise performance compared to a silicon transistor. If you're working for these sub you are different. You can have a broadband, then the impedance matching will be difficult for you. For the output of the amplifier, then the input. Again, that will affect the noise performance. So this one such examples, you can follow the book of receiver circuit design and technology for, you can choose the part numbers for different requirements. You can set up the RF chain. A one such freeware is provided by ADs analog devices, you can use that to have an initial flavor of what should be the performance of the RF chain. What is the requirement for the individual components? What is the error margin you have kept in the bandwidth? How to remove the unwanted image frequencies? How to tune the filters for different frequencies if you want to make it reconfigurable for different RF, because you have to reduce the cost of the RF chain. So you can use the same filter bank for different RF chains. You have to make it reconfigurable in that case. Then what is the insertion loss because of that reconfigurable filter design? Because what will not be same. A first-hand practice can be seen from here in calculating the parameters with these RF chains with the tools which are already available. This is the analog devices tool with which you can check the RF chain. You have to select the different components and see the cascaded effect of the system. Now, once you look into the problem with circuit specific, for that also, for a filter layout, for a layout of the mixer, the architecture analysis is important. What is the, how you're going to analyze the system? There is a Suppose if you consider a transistor, a fed transistor, there is an output impedance, you know the S parameter of the transistors, you can calculate the, from there you can find what is the requirement for the output impedance and the input impedance. So partition that into different segments. What are the filter specs which are with the cascaded segments? Problem partitioning is very important to tackle the individual segment of the circuit design and it makes you it makes you win half the battle of circuit design because if you can properly partition that attack the problem and go for a precise design for those segments then obviously when you build up the entire circuit it's going to work fine because your basic element was working fine then comes the 
representations in which way you are going to put it. You are going to go for the transmission line representations and then analyze the circuit. Or you want to go for the schematic analysis and then go for the individual transmission analysis and with the information you obtain from certain EM analysis. So methodical hybridization, that is also very important that you see the surface current requirements from the EM analysis. That helps you to tune the circuit topology. And then you can analyze them to find, reanalyze them to find the impedance requirements. Because obviously, the input impedance that you desire to find provides a lot of information about the circuit. And those are very inherent in the fundamental transmission line theory, which borrows the ideas from Foster's reactance theorem that the reactance in the sustenance slope is positive for a passive lossless linfo. Now, if you consider a matching element, a transmission line which is interconnecting with the next cascaded segment. A filter which is having its own IO ports with the resonators. That resonator may not be an uniform one that may have different shapes and sizes, different topologies. So to identify the frequencies, you need to calculate the input impedance. I do it, do it from hand calculations, calculate that input impedance from the standard transmission and 3D you have seen, but in for certain complex topologies, it may not be feasible for you to go for that. You break it down into transmission line model and then go for an ABCD analysis also. So if you see the information provided by this, that the reactance of the sensor is positive, then it should pass to multiple poles and zeros. And obviously you know that what are the resonance frequencies from there, at what, what are the transmission poles and the transmission zeros, frequencies at which it will be helpful to make where, make a stop band filter. This is widely known from the transmission line theory. We invoke it here to just have a quick appreciation of the fact that we can use short length of lines to behave as inductors, short lengths to behave as capacitors. Certain segments can behave as a, can provide you the resonance frequencies with which you can make a pen pass filter. Certain resonators with certain coupling from certain segment lengths, which can provide you the transmission zeros to make a stop band or to stop a higher unwanted frequency. So you can calculate the input impedance, equate it to zero, you get the resonance frequencies. Calculate the input admittance, equate it to zero, get the transmission frequencies, transmission points. So when you design and characterize the resonators, in the planar regime, you can find out the resonator topologies, choose the resonance segments, the transmission line segments to be used. It can be either same impedance, it can be um, different shapes and sizes. Multiple impedances can be there to get multiple modes. You can have control on these frequency spacing with these impedance control which is inherent to the stepped impedance resonator. And after choosing the topology, you characterize it for the resonant frequencies, the quality factor, and the coupling. And then implement that resonator to behave as a filter, a crossover, or if you start widening it with, it begins a microstick patch and an even with the appropriate feed. Now, to analyze that, you can see a typical example where the input impedance to obtain the resonant frequencies, we can calculate the input impedance with the 
analytically we can find what is the input impedance. For less complex segments is fine. We can approach this and find the resonance frequencies, this control of this presence. Many times parallel short circuit and open circuit stops are used for matching elements. In case of the IO networks for the active circuits, for mixers, LNS. In those cases, we can also find the input impedances. We can find what is the net input impedance once you find for the individual segments. But it can be a tedious way. You invoke another method instead of calculating the input impedances, you make it into a transmission line model. You see that the main transmission line is indicated by Z1 theta 1. The parallelly connected short circuited one is indicated as Z2 theta 2. And you know the standard templates from the network analysis and the UG courses that what should be the ABCD matrix for a induct, uh, sorry, admittance. So we can provide the appropriate ABCD matrix elements and then the cascaded form can be net ABCD matrix can be obtained by multiplying the two. We can do it similarly for any kind of whether short or open, we can follow the same process whether it is series connected or parallelly connected. So these examples which have been done has been for a stump loaded such kind of a resonant element has been analyzed using a matter code when we found that the results match quite satisfactorily with the electromagnetic simulations. You can also go for the weakly coupling of the resonant elements by actually giving the layout in any of these simulators, EM simulators, you'll find the same resonance bits. For the weakly coupling, you can observe the S2 on plots for that. So for a little complex systems, which are typically seen in the matching segments, there hand calculation of input impedance is really out of the question. There's a large probability of ending up with the wrong calculation, though there may be silly mistakes in your evaluation. So you can break up the problem, reduce the probability of error in your computation by going for the ABCD matrix route and analyze the circuits. This analysis helps you to implement that in the IO of the input or the output stages of other networks of the RFJ. So naturally, the problem partitioning is well appreciated from this fact that if I can break the circuit designs into small segments which has its own individual purpose and that is designed correctly, then obviously the entire circuit would be working fine. So let me skip some basic tutorial parts which are well known with the and the transmission lines, it is quite well known. I'm just giving that. Now, not all cases that you have a planar transmission lines being built up on a substrate and there's a non planar, there's a upper conductor which is providing quasi TM modes and it is propagating. But in implementing that in a integrated circuit, particularly in the silicon silicon dioxide systems. There, the ground may be somewhere on top of the bulk silicon. There can be other layers. It's a typical example where you see the upper conductor being on top of the silicon dioxide and 
we indicate that this is and this is this. I just uh, I'm just using the mouse because now the days of online has gone, so much of the systems have been now not in use. So one part of the conductor is having a different substrate. The ground is in the vicinity of another bulk silicon, which is having a different dilutive constant. It's not a typical microstrip scenario. And you know that for different CMOS processes, the metal layer thickness are different and, and they are also increasing as you go up the layers. So in those situations, you need to consider the additional quantities like what is the attenuation due to the dielectric, what is the surface resistance with the increasing thickness, with the thick, with the thin ones. This has to be also taken into consideration when building up the circuit. Without this, you may end up in a long current distribution that can inhibit the propagation of the signal of the information and the end circuit design may not be appropriate. So let us consider this for the 250 nanometer small structure where the elements can be synthesized and you can find out from here what is the transition frequency between the lumped and the distributed elements that can be approximated for implementing the distributed transmission line concepts in silicon silicon dioxide systems. Just a quick recap of the information because when you see the modal consideration, we need to take into account the dispersion effects at different frequencies. Whether you are working out with silicon silicon dioxide systems or you are working out with the limb arsenide, each will have a own variation of the dispersion characteristics with the frequency. You can see that uh, at the lower frequencies, sub 10 gigahertz, it is low dispersion. If you move up to the middle one, there is now it is a lucrative segment which has been looked at from 26.5 to 40, the K band. There you are going to suffer with high dispersion. You have to take into consideration the variation of the dielectric constant with frequency. And again, if you move higher up, then you need more worry about that. So that analysis. You can either follow the get singles relations, but these were restricted to certain the range of dielectric constants and certain width to height ratio. More improved formulations have come up. One is the Kobayashi's dispersion formulation for the planar segments. Mind it when you're working out with a standard commercial electromagnetic simulator. When you set the frequency ranges, this Kobayashi's relations are inbuilt in that. But if you are working out with the ABCD matrices and you want analyzing the microstrip structures, there you have to consider the dispersion, the effective, epsilon effective, the Kobayashi's model you have to implement while solving for the segment lengths and calculating the S parameters. When you are following, you are writing your own code to do that. You have to consider the 
को रिलेशन इफ यू है विल नॉट बी सो मच प्रॉब्लमेटिक फॉर यू यू विल गेट नियर अबाउट सेम वैल्यूज दो वी आर नॉट सो मच कॉशियस अबाउट दैट बट वेन यू आर गोइंग अप इन दी फ्रीक्वेंसी डोमेन यू हैव टू इम्प्लीमेंट दैट वेन यू आर एनलाइजिंग स्मॉल सेगमेंट विद कॉमन पार्टिशनिंग यू जनरली सेव टाइम बाय एनालाइजिंग दैट थ्रू दी एबीसीडी मैट्रिक्स रूट सो इन दोज केसेज यू हैव टू कंसिडर दैट बिकॉज सॉल्विंग द एंटायर सर्किट With EM analysis every time is again not feasible. Just implementing a vector diode with a array, ten cross ten array, with the vector diode model takes at least three days of simulation for to understand what is the effect of impinging a plane wave on that. If you have resonators which are interconnected with the vector diode. it becomes very computationally costly so if you want to see the effect of the unit elements it's better to implement its resonance models go for a transmission line formulation and then analyze that separately but it costs you to use the cobiasis dispersion formula if you're working for 26.5 to 14 in the k band if you're working with so with the rfi and mmi segments we have to be little bit cautious in calculating the surface ray impedance the surface ray distances and surface inductances the existence of surface impedance that escalates at millimeter wave frequency and cause potential problem in tuning the frequencies a metal pad for example typically used for rounding it has a surface impedance it prevents a perfect round connection so you have to have a proper analysis of those raised pads and obviously to consider the c phase sensors you can use the standard relations for c phase sensors here and find out and consider with this skin depth that has to be separated out from the two sides and then we have to subtract two delta from width and from the thickness then you will get the appropriate value if you just use rho l by w into t width into the thickness you may not get that in the high frequency ranges you may be having the wrong calculation of the shape transistors so for the planar transmission and segments in case of environments where silicon silicon dioxide are present when it is microstrip like what the oxide layer the dielectric loss is normally lower than to that of the conductor however these transmission lines are deposited directly on the low raised with is semiconductor substrate and the dielectric loss become dominant that is the floating ground will have it facing a different dielectric loss and the top metallic conductor included of the silicon dioxide system will have different dielectric loss if you are implementing such conductors directly on the silicon substrate then there should be proper shielding so that the fields are confined a typical example here that if you see the metallic layers that thickness increases how the metallic layers has to be inserted to create to 
to make it work out like a floating ground. But the fields are preventing from the other layers, metallic structures. If you want to implement a 50 ohm segment, in those cases, a small incision here, if you see, can allow you the fields to enter in that region and balance the impedance. So you have to balance either the capacitances, you have to nullify the, reduce the capacitances, thereby improve that, and then you have to balance the impedances, whatever is required. For transmission lines in CMOS particularly, the analysis for silicon silicon dioxide systems had been proposed by Hasegawa. These results are quite pertinent till now, way back in 1971. If you have a, such a nanoscale dimension, with a few microns, maybe the length of a segment, which can be the resonant element, whose impedance you have tuned for a different, for a given layer. But how to allow for such small lengths? The signal should propagate for a given frequency that may be very small compared to its wavelength. So you have to consider the another propagation mode apart from that which we generally know that is the slow wave mode. Quasi TM mode you are aware of which is generally we consider the quasi TM fault at the lower frequencies when we are implementing at the using a substrate like either gallium arsenide or gallium nitride or just using a PTFE substrate and implementing a it is, it is copper clad on both sides and etching the design on the top layer. We generally go for a quasi TM analysis. But for a silicon silicon type system, it's the slow wave mode, which also is beneficial. And the slow wave mode can be analyzed by considering the system of silicon silicon dioxide system epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and the metal layers are there as a Maxwell Wagner capacitor. This analysis, uh, I can just keep for the time because we have five, uh, we are only two minutes left, I think. So you can model that and get the effective epsilon and then you can use it in calculating the inductances and capacitances for the quasi TM mode and the equivalent transmission line model for the skin effect mode and for the slow wave mode. You can find what is the element values. But what is the usefulness in this? If you can reduce the phase velocity, then you can increase beta. And if you can increase beta, you can achieve a high quality factor within this few micron dimension. This is typically shown for a CPW system, open of a pay, widely used for nanoscale CMOS circuit build up for millimeter wave frequencies. And this is for a 35 nanometer CMOS process as CPW, which is Providing the slow wave mode 
with the back conductors being interdigitally there are certain rows of conductors and there is another of dimension SS is the slot is cut on that. This is requirement for the density requirement of the particular layer for a CMOS process. And without violating the density requirement, you can design the transmission line segment with this slow wave mode and use it to build up the circuit systems. Now, I'm again skipping the even or more characteristics, which is but implemented to the and this is part. So you can see that once you go for such kind of a multi-layered structure for a given CMOS process, the various conductors, there's the actual conductor thickness. You see the top layer is M4 is 2.8 microns, M3 is 0.64 micron, M2 is 0.925 micron, and it increases M1 0.64. So Considering these layers, what are the effects of the fields? And excitation of one segment is providing a coupling with the next segment. So how to provide the necessary shielding? How to balance the impedances of the transmission segments? This becomes a really challenging fact, wherein you have to keep in mind that these are the slow wave modes which are getting excited in such kind of a circuit. We can make reconfigurable circuits even for the planar systems, as I was mentioning as a part of the RF chain, using the same filter elements for multiple systems. So those reconfigurable you can use the diodes, but you have to keep in mind about the biasing for the diodes. So some tri-band and multi-band, multi-band to wide-band responses were designed for certain wireless applications. The techniques of ABCD matrices for individually analyzing them has been taken up. Finding the input impedance resonance characteristics of the individual segment that takes care of that. Every time taking up a full EM analysis for feeding with the diodes is also not feasible because of computational cost. And this is for the ultra wide band to wide band responses. There are certain specifications where we wanted to go for a wide band filter using the 180 nanometer process. So the filter synthesis methods will be so, but the layout part will be different because here we cannot use a commensurate line for an inductor. The key takeaway I can mention here, that if you take a short circuit lambda by four and think that it will start behaving as an inductor, it's too length, it's, it's quite a large length lambda by four corresponding to there. So in those cases, you have to use spiral inductor models. There are a lot of inductor models. And given a particular CMOS fabrication process, you see which FabLabs model you are going to use, and then implement that particular inductor model for the inductors, because they take the maximum space also in the circuit. You can see the layout here. And a layout I did at the, at the inductors are taking maximum part of the filter. You can have different layouts provided. You the library has that support for that. We use the SCL one eighty for this. Some examples of again the six, 50 to 60 years balloons and filters that the
various transistor performance are provided here. So you can have a comparative study in choosing what transistor you're going to do for an essay. RFIC or MMIC or going for the um, CMOS buildup or you are going to make an uh, SOC out of that also for the if you have a you're going to implement in the entire CMOS process or you're going to implement the SOC on a given one slide. See the noise figures for the different transistors. In fact, um, the gallium nitride is having still less compared to them. And in building up the active circuits, you need to characterize the transistor as parameters. For that, you require a probe station and a network analyzer. And you see that the bare transistor, the GSE probes are connected to the jigs which are housing the gate source. And then you can characterize these parameters from that. Using this model, so you can build up the equivalent circuit. Use this equivalent circuit and in the schematic of the other circuit elements. If you're building up an RF mixer, then use this schematic with the other input output matching elements and then see what is the behavior of that. So the equivalent circuit, both in cheap and packaged, which comes along with the transistor data sheet. If you're purchasing a transistor of a given part number, it comes out with the equivalent circuits and the circuit parameters also. It helps you to build up the input and output matching elements and design the appropriate matching circuits. This is the example of a conjugate matching, which is implemented for this. So the linear model of a 180 nanometer CMOS transistor from 0.1 to 20 is done with a open variable. You can use QCS quite universal circuit simulator. And our results match with the uh, that of the, which is provided in these data sheets. So this uh, design flow for the MMIC solution, you can break it up into the problem, but you have to see the requirements. What is the requirement of the particular system? For which user? That user is the customer. Suppose it is for the particular service provider of a communication system. So what is the switch bands they're using? What is the specification? So then you can tune it with your circuit analysis and EM analysis and come up with the this part I can skip for now. Just brushing up right it is it was for it two, three hours or anyway. So as I was mentioning that the input output matching networks design for this particular gallium arsenide nesfit mixer, you can see that stumps are used for certain matching elements. The low pass filter is connected at the output to remove the unwanted higher frequencies. And also the input matching segments. And this is governed by the equivalent circuit. What is provided, what the equivalent circuit is input impedance is provided by that. You can find the input and the output reflection coefficients using standard relations from transmission line theory. And then you can design the networks. In fact, um, we can move further for the CMOS circuit and elements and come up with Gilbert cell mixers with low current alternative also using the current bleed techniques. So I can just uh, quickly uh, help you to go through the different books like that of the Robertson for the RFIC, MMIC. It's uh, quite an interesting read. And uh, obviously, Thomas Lee is a widely referred book for design of CMOS RFICs. Though the continuation from analog electronics to RFIC, those are 
beginners um, though these are not detailing of the input of good matching because you can find from the Razavi's book you can do that and if you are working out with the pin diodes and others you can a quick read it can be from the Ludwig's book overall the book of Nigel is very much suitable it's quite exhaustive we took the example for the transistor model for 0.1 to 20 from that particular book where the data sheet has been verified using QCS and of his uh, Rogers book of uh, RF integrated circuit is also quite fine for the calculation of the surface basins where you should do it where where you should take in those into concern so thank you i had to a little bit speed up because of the time constraints and, and i also extrapolated my 11 minutes thank you sir thank yes, you sir. for your valuable time. thanks a lot yeah okay other okay uh, any questions uh, from others any questions Any questions? Okay, thank you, sir. I think uh, one have any question. I, well, I have some. Okay, me and something to say. Okay. Uh, I uh, I don't know whether Professor Ghatakrodro remembers me or not. Professor Rodo, you, you know me? Sir, I have uh, asked for your blessings at the beginning. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, actually, uh, first time I have seen you at Mankundu Engineering Sir. College, you know, and I was overwhelmed by your lecture there. And uh, similarly, I am uh, overwhelmed by the scintillating lectures of yours in the area of circuit design challenges uh, in communic next generation communication engineering. I, I uh, recently I visited Siri Pirani where I think you did your MTech project work. Am I correct? Yes, sir. What was the area? Uh, s band Magneton. I was under Sardaji. Sardar, Sardar Prasad has retired. Then BVP Singh, my PhD student, was, took over. He also retired. Now Shivendra Modiya. Again, probably he is from Bardhavan University. Yes, sir. You are also from Bardhavan University. You went there as well. And also Anivan Bera. Hmm. Uh, Anivan Bera, you know? Dr. Yeah. Yeah. You know Hasibur Rahman? Yes. They are all okay. one year senior to me. Yes, senior to Recently, I had been at dinner in their respective houses at Sidi Pulani. I was there uh, uh, along with my wife uh, during six, six to from six to twelve of this month. So I remembered you, and I I mentioned you in one of my lectures there. Probably I mentioned you in my uh, in my first the, in the first lecture of this program. I mentioned you Sir. because. You are uh, you are one of the greatest uh, scientists of the country, and you are one of the greatest experts in the area of electromagnetic engineering. I visited for your uh, for the audience to, to know that I visited the Imperial College of Science and Technology, Imperial Imperial College, now it has become also College of Medicine in the year in 1990s okay and then most probably yes the name of the department i visited i was invited was the department of electromagnetic engineering electromagnetic engineering and in that department the work in the area of antennas was going on the work in the area of electron devices microtubes were going on and i was invited there 
And so, uh, I have a question to ask you because you are the one of the greatest experts in the country in the area of electromagnetic theory. I know that. So my question is, with the advent of the simulation course and all that, how much is it necessary to include the course of electromagnetic theory in the in in academic uh, in, in academic institutions? Because this is the college, this is the conference, this is the short-term program for for a faculty development program. Yes. And can you throw light upon this question? My question, I repeat. How much is it necessary to learn electromagnetic theory in view of the recent visavi, uh, the recent advances, the recent uh, uh, you know uh, availability of simulation course? So I would like to ask, uh, tell me and the participants if there is any necessity to study electromagnetic theory at all. So from my view, the study of electromagnetics, though it's named for the engineering courses, they put up electromagnetic theory has changed its name to electromagnetic engineering. The content remains the same. And obviously, if you consider the analog electronics, network analysis and synthesis, electromagnetic engineering, they are the pillars on which the different domains of electronics, circuit design and related systems are dependent. If one misses out the beauty of understanding the current in the circuit, I think that circuit designer misses out how to innovate that circuit. So to feel the current in the circuit, one has to have an understanding of the electromagnetic fundamentals. And it should not be restricted to the fundamental electromagnetics courses, which are into the more or less into the third and fourth cell. What I feel that nowadays the use of tools has been a rather brute force techniques, wherein the theory of scattering, the geometric theory of diffraction is not appreciated by the person, but that person is using softwares like wireless insight to see the ray tracing models, whose background theory is the geometric theory of diffraction. So how one can appreciate the results, improve upon that without understanding the background theory. The fundamentals, if they are understood by, from pedagogical view also I'm considering because many of us, we try to also uh, skip certain topics, which would be rather very pertinent to understand even the circuit designs in the nanoscale domain. In fact, if the simulations that I showed in some slides, wherein I considered the 35 nanometer CMOS process, this took the example of simple conductors of different thicknesses and its effect on the neighboring circuits, its analysis was done using CST. Now, if you consider the power distribution network in an indicator circuit, it starts with the, I have uh, seen a book, which starts with devoting two chapters on electromagnetics and then introduces the power distribution network in the integrated circuit. So how one can be optimizing this layout for power distribution network without understanding this very small fact that the surface current is equal to n cap plus h and that h is the tangential component of the magnetic field on the conductor, which is part of the power distribution network. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, 
BigQuery. Yes. yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, uh, may I ask a question, please? Yes. Yes, yes, yes Jit. Jit, go ahead. Jit. Sir, good afternoon uh, to yes. honorable guest speaker. Sir, I have two fundamental questions and uh, advanced question uh, as per my knowledge. My first question is, can we apply ABCD parameter to a network having more than two ports? Uh, generally, I have read over uh, some national uh, databases, I will not take the names, that ABCD parameter has a limitation that it cannot be applied to uh, amplifiers or circuit having more than two ports. So therefore, S yes, parameter is preferred for multi-port network. So can we apply ABCD parameter to uh, input network, uh, input network having more than two can, ports? Um, you can apply to those, suppose a four port network like a production hybrid coupler. You can apply their ABCD matrices by invoking Bartlett theorem, which is a bisection theorem. For symmetrical networks, you can do so. Okay. For non-symmetrical, you cannot do so. Quadrature hybrid coupler is an example where we where the analysis are generally done using by invoking Bartlett theorem, but it is not mentioned in the book. Okay, sir. My next question is, uh, while teaching uh, distributed and lumped elements in the classroom uh, and following some books, I have found that in case of distributed elements, in case of transmission lines, high frequency engineering, uh, it is said that we cannot apply KCL and KVL at higher frequencies in microwave range. Is that a correct assumption or uh, it, it also has some uh, mystery behind it? KCL and my last question, yeah. from the equation of continuity. Which came first, KCL, KVL or equation of continuity? Uh, KCL, equation KVL. Can we apply KCL and KVL to circuits for that at high frequency? Yeah. Okay. For that, you try to appreciate this. The equation of continuity. What does it mention? Uh, so if you appreciate the equation of continuity, then you can apply the equation of continuity at any junctions of any circuit elements where there are flow of electrons. So naturally you can apply. In fact, if you see the uh, transmission line distributed circuit network, if you take the fundamental book of UG teaching like Leo, you will see that they are starting with the KCL, KBL to arrive at the Telegraphers equation. Okay, sir. okay. Thank you, sir. My last question. Uh, in your slides, I have seen that uh, there is a mutual coupling or there is some coupling effect when we are uh, exciting one of the elements uh, under the silicon dioxide layer or one element's excitation is influencing other elements' excitation or uh, effects on it. So are there any studies or investigations which are present in the, in the current literature which talks about a reverse coupling effect to nullify the coupling? Just like in case of MIMO antennas, we use neutralization line or parasitic elements to neutralize the current from one element on another element and finally coupling is reduced. So are there any such investigations in case of uh, this nanoscale devices? I cannot say it as investigation. I can say it as the experience of a circuit designer who understands the layout density rules, who understands the planar layout density rules apart from understands electromagnetics and brings these two information together to place the components to actually implement the topology of the ground plane or the conducting plane in such a way that the coupling is reduced. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, my classroom teaching will improve with your uh, suggestions. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. Sir. Uh, uh, I request uh, Ms. Jit, Mr. Dr. Jeet Banerjee, to introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, sir, Dhanan. I am Jeet Banerjee. I am an assistant professor in the department of ECE at Adamas University, Kolkata. And I'm currently pursuing my PhD under Professor Rodro Ghatok from NIT Durgapur. I am in the advanced stage of my PhD. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.
थैंक यू ओके नमस्कार टू ऑल थैंक यू सर ओके आई एम लीविंग ओके ओके नाउ वी थिंक वी एंड अप ओके नेक्स्ट सेशन नेक्स्ट सेशन एट 2:30 पीएम सर what is the what is the topic and all that ah oh. uh, sir uh, i know that but please repeat ah <laughs> uh, no sir i think ch- some changes occurred uh, today in 230 uh, sorry sir are you there yes he is there uh, okay 230 i think um, there our honorable principal sir sanjay s power sir uh, delivered some talk about uh, but uh, i just not getting the what should what is the duration what is the duration of the talk oh sir it is maybe 232 no information is coming after 232 uh, maybe it is professor yes. uh, sarit pal please elaborate okay sir sarit elaborate 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 karo koto kon how much 232 232 sir please around approximately 130 No, sir. Two thirty. So only I think it is two thirty. Two thirty to five p.m. I think so, maybe so it is some. So only talk for so many hours. Ah uh, no, no, sir. I think let me get you full. Ah, sir. Man, I mean, what a change is coming. Ni sorry, sir. So it is only two thirty to I think it is two thirty to three thirty or maximum. Two thirty or it could go up to four o'clock. Is it? Ah, maximum. Ah. Sorry, it's not going to change. Sorry, it's sorry, it cannot be heard. No, no, ah, sir. Sorry, the we cannot hear you. Sorry, the cannot hear. No, no, he cannot be heard. Yes. Sorry, Krishna. Now, now can yes, I can, I can. We can hear now. Sir, actually, uh, we had a uh, uh, initially we have a plan that we shall conduct one technical session And by Jyoti Electronics, but the person who was supposed to deliver the lecture, he is medically unfit at present. So yes. our principal, sir, uh, Professor uh, Sanjay S. Power. He will deliver the lecture on 5G and its ecosystem. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, the thing is that the initial the session was scheduled for two and uh, two hours 30 minutes. That is from 2:30 to 5 p.m. Now, if the participants can understand up, uh, for so many uh, hours, then he will continue. Okay. If the participants can uh, uh, have no bird uh, can understand, he will continue. Otherwise, he will stop earlier. That depends on the participants, sir. Okay. 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 Because you see, uh, he may give some break also in mid in between. Okay. If required. I'll be there for some time. I should be there for some time. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Sir. Thank you okay, very sir. much. Sir. Wonderful session it was. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Bye bye.
Ah, não, eu não sei, 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 eu não s